Hey there. Today's lecture is on chapter 12 in the textbook, um, one of the shorter lectures. It's also one of the shorter chapters in the textbook. So it's on material and spatial tensor fields, which is kind of one paragraph there that we've already discussed. And it's also on pull back and push forward operations, <coughs> which we have sort of discussed although indirectly. So let's start. A uh, tensor field can, you know, have as independent variables either position in the reference configuration or position in the spatial configuration, and that really doesn't matter because we can identify the two sets of points because of the deformation. So we'll say a tensor field G. <coughs> which can be a function of material points <coughs> and time, or equivalently, g can be understood as a function of spatial points and time, is called So first, a spatial tensor field, if G maps spatial vectors to spatial vectors, <coughs> actually spatial vector fields to spatial vector fields. <clears throat> A material tensor field, if it maps <clears throat> material vector fields to material vector fields, so, you know, vector fields in the reference configuration, And it's called a mixed tensor field if it maps material vector fields to spatial vector fields or vice versa. <clears throat> So of the, um, the tensor fields that we've dealt with that are all based on the deformation gradient, we have the following. <coughs> v, the, um, what will that be called? That'll be called the left stretch tensor. B, the left Cauchy green deformation tensor. L, the velocity gradient. D, the stretching tensor, which is the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. And W, which is the <coughs> spin tensor, the 
skew symmetric part of the spatial velocity gradient. Are spatial tensor fields. They map spatial vectors to spatial vectors. <coughs> U, the, uh, the right stretch tensor, or, <clears throat> yeah, the, the right stretch tensor, um, C, and E. E being the green St. Venant strain tensor, are material tensor fields. They map material vectors to material vectors. And F, the deformation gradient, and R, the rotation tensor in the polar decomposition of F, are mixed tensor fields. In both cases here, F and R map material vectors to spatial vectors. So a, a linear operation <coughs> that takes a spatial tensor field and returns a material tensor field is called a pullback. One that goes the other way is called a push forward. All right, so the inverse of a pullback is a push forward. And I suppose that they call it pullback because your reference configuration is kind of the <coughs> thing that everything is based off of. So you're pulling it back to your, your basis configuration, you know, that everything is, well, not basis in the sense of vector spaces, but you're your reference configuration, you know, the thing that you're defining everything in terms of you're pulling your deformed configuration back to that <coughs> and making a tensor field based off of it. And push forward goes the other way. All right, so let's say that G is a spatial tensor field. Then we'll define this operation P on G as the tensor that is <coughs> F transpose G F. Well, that's a material tensor field.
right? Because F takes material vectors and spits out spatial vectors. G takes a spatial vector and spits out another spatial vector. And F transpose takes a spatial vector <coughs> and spits out a, uh, a material vector. So it takes a material vector, makes a spatial, spatial material. Well, this spitting is probably not a good idea in COVID times, so maybe it uh, just returns it instead. All right, so because this is a you know, linear operation that is taking a spatial tensor field and returning a material tensor field, this uh, shiny blackboard, we would call it in the tech, P of G is a pullback of G. <coughs> So there's really only four pullbacks that are worth talking about. Um, they're all constructed from the deformation gradient F. So we're going to make all four of them. And two of them are going to be used pretty often, and the other two are going to be used less often. So another one. Another one is fancy blackboard P with a line under it, G, which is defined as F inverse, G, F <coughs> inverse transpose. So both P of G and P underscore of G, um, <clears throat> and they'll get into why that notation in chapter 13, one's going to be the covariant pullback and the other will be the contravariant pullback. Either way, both of these to preserve symmetry and skew symmetry. And this is pretty easy to show. Um, if we look at the transpose of the first P of G, this is equal to F transpose G transpose F. <coughs> And if we look back, well, that goes to F transpose over here, that goes to G transpose, that goes to F over there. So that is equal to, we also see that this one is F transpose G F. Well, this is equal to that same pullback <coughs> of G transpose. And the fact that it behaves in this manner, you know, that the transpose of the pullback is equal to the pullback of the transpose, um, is, you know, necessary and sufficient for it to preserve symmetry and skew symmetry. And that one, I mean, you can demonstrate it to yourself in, in components, but... <clears throat> 
at least, you know, on the surface looking at it, it makes sense that it would have to. Um, I would encourage you not to believe me and to do it in components and show that something that the transpose of it is equal to it of the transpose preserves symmetry and skew symmetry. That's um, actually, you know, in, in academia, especially, well, not even in academia, in research in general, um, you know, we, we talked to the other class about, oh, it seems on the surface like, uh, yeah, symmetric things ought to be closed under multiplication, right? Holy crap, they're not. Um, so don't necessarily take anything that you expect to be the case for granted, or if someone says it, and you hear it, and you're like, oh, that makes sense, but you haven't actually seen it proven. <clears throat> um, as, as a PhD person in engineering science, or, you know, if you're not in ESM, any of the hard engineering subjects, which, I mean, they're all hard at a graduate level, you know, people are relying on you to be able to weed out the BS. Um, <clears throat> and so it's really our jobs as engineering professionals, particularly higher education ones with masters and PhDs, you really have to be skeptical of, of claims that people make because they, you know, through no fault of their own necessarily, um, do get pretty far sometimes in the publication process. Uh, sometimes things even get printed in journals every now and then where there are false claims like that. Um, and it's not because people are trying to do anything nefarious, you know, it, it just is, uh, it's pretty time consuming to go through and, and prove everything all the time. But you should strive to, and if someone makes a claim, you should know that, hey, that can actually be, you know, proven with math. And if you can't really figure out how to prove it or they don't show how to prove it, you should maybe put a little question mark next to it and strive to figure out what's going on there. Because <clears throat> otherwise, that's how problems persist in, say, physical models or simulation tools for a decade or something until someone goes around looking at it and is like, hey, that's weird. And then they finally get around to looking at it and work out the math. And sure enough, oh, that doesn't work because this uh, equality is not true. All right. So that, that comes from like things that I've seen in my not really that long career, but long enough. I think I've been doing this for five six years since my PhD, a lot of model development and stuff. So if you look, you know, carefully at things, you'll see it too. Um, and it's not that everyone out there is idiots or anything like that. It just is a, a very difficult subject and everyone's always rushed. <clears throat> so you run into it, you know, people are like, ah, oh, this is clearly true, but sometimes it's not. All right. So let's look at the transpose of the other one. P, fancy blackboard one with the line under it now. G, transpose is equal to F inverse G transpose F inverse transpose. It's a lot of inverses there. <clears throat> All right, so that is equal to P with the fancy line under it of G transpose, right? We can go back up. Can we like, oh, look at that. Yeah, so we see if we want to take the transpose of this thing, the transpose of F inverse transpose goes there, but that's just F inverse. The transpose of F inverse goes there. That's F inverse transpose, and G gets G transposed. 
stays in the middle. Well, there, I gone and done it now. There we go. I think that. Do we have the whole page? Cool, it snaps to it. All right. <clears throat> so these two preserve symmetry and skew symmetry, which is pretty nice because um, if we're talking about, say, the rate of rotation or the rate of strain, then like the, the skew symmetric part of the velocity gradient has something to do with the rate of rotation and the symmetric part of it has something to do with the rate of strain. And, you know, that really shouldn't matter whether you're talking about the reference configuration or the spatial configuration. <clears throat> Rotation rates involve in three dimensions, you know, an axial vector, you're rotating about something, so there should be a skew symmetric. Well, heck, in any dimension, the the derivative of a, uh, a rotation should always be a skew symmetric. <clears throat> and then the, uh, the symmetric part is always, you know, that, that one's derivative is always going to be also the symmetric part there. Um, the other two that we're going to show briefly here, they preserve trace. But the trace you can think of as like the trace of, say, the velocity gradient has to do with the derivative of the Jacobian determinant. Well, you can see how, so the Jacobian determinant being, say, like the volume ratio of the deformed to the reference configuration. So it would kind of make sense that that rate of volumetric change relative to the volume, that maybe shouldn't be preserved from the spatial configuration to the <clears throat> reference configuration since your volume is already messed up in the spatial configuration. So you wouldn't want to, you know, you're multiplying it by a different number. And so that's why these other two that we're about to introduce, um, while they are pullbacks, they aren't frequently used pullbacks. That's not going to work. Or so the other two, which we don't even give names to, but they exist, are um, F inverse, G, F, and <coughs> F transpose, G, F inverse transpose. And they don't preserve symmetry. We'll... Uh, demonstrate that pretty quick here. So if we take the transpose of the first one, you know, watch this. All right, so we can write the transpose of that is going to be F transpose G transpose F inverse transpose, which is coincidentally the, uh, the that one. <clears throat> but that sure is not equal to F inverse G transpose F, and likewise, 
the transpose of the other one. is equal to f mm -hmm. not minus transpose minus in or f inverse like that g transpose and f which there again is not equal to f transpose g transpose f inverse transpose <clears throat> but they do preserve trace. And we'll show that. So uh, since the trace of AB is equal to the trace of BA, We have that the trace of F inverse G F <clears throat> is equal to, we're going to move the F inverse over to the right using the trace of AB is equal to trace of BA. That has to be equal to the trace of G F F inverse, right? And then the F and F inverse cancel out is equal to the trace G and you know the same sort of thing is going to apply for the other one. I mean, do that in the old little one liner here. The trace of F transpose G F inverse transpose is equal to the trace of G F inverse transpose. F transpose, which there again is equal to the trace of G. <clears throat> so like I mentioned, and you probably guessed, uh, the first two of these that actually got assigned special symbols end up being useful pretty often. And the, the last two um, that preserve trace but not symmetry end up being less useful, so we don't really give them special names. And it's a shame to be those pullbacks. So the, the inverses of the pullbacks that, well, the inverse of any pullback is a push forward. And so we're going to uh, write out the inverses of the pullbacks that we actually care about here. And those are going to be the push forwards that we care about. So we got blackboard style P without a line under it, inverse, acting on M, where M is now a material tensor field, is defined as F <coughs> inverse transpose M F inverse. Well, if we put that, have it act, on P of G, where G is a spatial tensor field, then that is equal to F inverse transpose, F transpose G, F, F inverse. Well, that's pretty obviously equal to G. So that's good. <coughs> And likewise with P, fancy blackboard with a bar under it, inverse of P, fancy blackboard with a bar under it, 
of g that way. Well, that one is equal to f, f inverse. That's a negative right there. Uh, g, f inverse transpose, f transpose, which again is equal to g. All right, so one neat result of all of this that we've already kind of shown, but we'll put it explicitly. Uh, the green St. Venant strain tensor, or E, we've already said, is this. So we have E is equal to one half F transpose F minus the identity. <coughs> So if we take its time derivative, e dot, the identity doesn't really have any time derivative if the one half stays. Well, that is f transpose time derivative times f plus f transpose times f's time derivative. And you'll recall that d, the stretching tensor, is equal to one half the velocity gradient plus the transpose of the velocity gradient, which is equal to one half f dot f inverse plus, don't do that, f inverse transpose f dot transpose. All right, well, if we look at the first pullback of D, so the one without the fancy line under it, that is going to be f transpose D F. We'll substitute our expression in for D there. Move the one half out of everything since we can. It's going to be F transpose F dot F inverse plus F inverse transpose, f dot transpose f. All right, well, in the first term here, the uh, f inverse on the right is going to cancel out with the f, and in the second term, the f inverse transpose cancels out with the f transpose, so we have that is equal to 1 half. <coughs> F transpose F dot plus F dot transpose F. Well, if we go back to E dot, that is uh, the same thing. So that is equal to the time derivative of the green St. Venant strain tensor. And so that's why, like, particularly in fluid mechanics, you'll hear the symmetric part of the velocity gradient being referred to as the strain rate tensor. Now, for it to actually be the strain rate, when we're talking about strain being the green St. Venant strain, uh, you, you do have to pull it back from the spatial tensor field to a material tensor field. All right, so that's how it goes with the, uh, the tensor fields, pullbacks and push forwards. Um, the pullbacks and push forwards for vector fields are even simpler. They just go with F and, well, F transpose and F inverse for the pullbacks and inverse transpose and F for the, uh, the push forwards. <coughs> so these were all left as exercises to the, uh, to the reader in chapter 12, but we'll kind of work out some of them here.
that should say nuances. <coughs> there we go. So there's a lot less to it for vector fields. All right, oh, don't do that. The pullbacks are these. Or at least the relevant pullbacks, you know, are um, P, which now is not a fancy blackboard one, of a spatial vector field G is defined as F transpose G and P with a fancy line under it, the tensor, it looks like a mess, doesn't it? Is defined as F inverse of G. So the push forwards are the inverses of those two. <coughs> All right, well, we can relate the tensor pullbacks to the vector pullbacks. The tensor pullback without the line under it of spatial vector G, tensor product, spatial vector H. That one is by definition F transpose, the tensor G, tensor product, H acting on F. All right, so in, in our last homework assignment, we showed that this is equal to F transpose G tensor product F transpose H. And by what we just defined above, that is equal to the vector pullback of G tensor product, <coughs> the vector pullback of H. And likewise, we can do it with the other one, P, the tensor pullback with the fancy line under it, of G tensor product H is equal to F inverse G tensor product H F inverse transpose. Well, that is equal to F inverse of G tensor product F inverse of H from you know, the exact same idea. So that is equal to that pullback of G tensor product, that same pullback of H. <clears throat> all right, that's all that we got for chapter 12. We'll get on to chapter 13 probably tomorrow a little behind where I wanted to be for this week. Um, and in that one, we'll give, uh, give some meaning to, you know, the one without the fancy line under it and the one with the fancy line under it. You know, one's going to be covariant and one's going to be contravariant. And then we'll probably after that have uh, two more lectures of kinematics and we'll be on to basic mechanical principles. So that'll be exciting. Um, all right. Hope you guys and gals have a good night. I'll catch you later.